Let's go to our panel now. I've got with me Bruce Hawker and also Graham Morris is here in the studio with me. Gentlemen, thanks for your time. Graham, the tapes, first of all, shock horror, I guess some people might say. Malcolm Turnbull's not too happy with having been deposed and uh, is a little bit disgruntled with former Prime Ministers as well. I guess he's in the club now, so what did you well, make of this? Well, that's right, but when you think about it, what would you expect him to say? Mm. You know, um, you know, I was really thrilled that I was knocked off and my best friend Tony Abbott and I, we got together and we cooked up this scheme whereby, you know, after a few years I'd get knocked off and I'd go and have a year beard holiday in New York. You know, of course he would say he was disappointed and he's not thrilled by Tony Abbott. And you think, well, yeah, but, you know, it's... It, look, I was at the Rugby League last night with the Prime Minister, former Prime Minister Howard, a whole bunch of fantastic rugby league people. No-one mentioned Turnbull. No-one mentioned Abbott. They've all sort of moved on. Yes, there's still a couple of disgruntled politicians, a couple of upset branches in the Liberal Party and a whole bunch of journos. Most other people are moving on. I hope you were like the normal fan and actually out watching the, gra the game, Graham Morris. Maybe that's why no-one was talking about... I, uh, yeah, 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 it was, the, was, the, it was the NRL grand final. I've got to tell you, I find it, found it really odd that an Australian crowd would boo a champion in Billy Slater. It was just un-Australian. Weird. I mean, well, we're getting off topic here, but weird, I guess. It was hardly his fault and hardly a brutal hit that he did to not eventually get rubbed out. But I do digress, Bruce Hawker. <laughs> Miserable ghosts, fair call. You talking about Billy Slater still? Or? <laughs> <laughs> uh, he was an unhappy ghost, I he, think. He, yeah. he, was, he, was, he was very unhappy last night and so was um, his captain. But, uh, look, I, I think the Turnbull business is just crazy, really. I mean, he, he has joined the ghost club, whether he likes it or not. He might be uh, one of the undead. You know, he doesn't realise that he's actually passed over to the other side, but he has. And, uh, and uh, as sad as that may be for him and his supporters, that's the brutal reality that he's living with now. And he's, he's going to suffer all, all the problems that former Prime Ministers suffer from, you know, uh, relevance deprivation. He'll be pushing himself into the media when, it, when he can. Uh, and, mm. uh, and, and I think a lot of the time it'll be unhelpful because to the extent that he now has to make way for Morrison and be seen to be part of that healing process, uh, it's very critical that he doesn't uh, inject himself into the discussions too much. That's uh, to his great credit. He didn't inject himself this time, did he? Is that not fair enough to say? This is leaked audio. He sounded like he was trying to make them laugh to me. Well, perhaps. But, uh, yeah, I, I think the reality, though, is that the biggest problem that the Liberal Party has right now is this lingering... Uh, a dissension within its ranks. You know, he's, he's unhappy, Abbott's unhappy, uh, there are other people within the National Party who are unhappy, Barnaby Joyce and others. So this is the biggest obstacle, I think, that Scott Morrison has to actually uh, becoming a serious contender but, but, at the coming but election. Bruce, but, but, Bruce, people do move on. You, you know, you, you think um, Gillard and Rudd, you know, are we all still there talking mm. about Gillard and Rudd hating each other? You know, we we move on. Exactly. I think and, we and do. But, I, uh, look, I agree with you, Graham. But, but I, all I'm I, saying is you don't... The important thing is that they remove themselves from the debate, from the discussion and from mm. the public light. I mean, Rudd and Gillard did that by, you know, in Rudd's case, going overseas. Gillard basically, uh, you know, took up other non-political sort of roles on the international uh, front. So I think that's what Turnbull's got to do. And, and I noticed last night, you know, somebody who has played the game well, John Howard, at the Rugby League Grand Final with the sort of next generation was mobbed. Everyone wanted, you know, selfies to shake his hand to congratulate him on the way he'd handle himself and, you know, you'd wish all leaders were the same. Julia Gillard, well, I think, is the same with, ex um, with you know, Labor um, acolytes, if you like, as well. And I think you make a point there, uh, Graeme Morris, about that moving on. That, that affects your legacy, doesn't it, Bruce Hawker? 
Uh, it does. You can't be, you know, the ghost who walks. You can't keep injecting yourself back into the process. Politicians attempted to do it, particularly former prime ministers and premiers, when they think that their legacy is under threat in some shape or form. But and I think at times that is fair mm. enough for them to do that if they feel that mm. you know, they're being misrepresented in some way. You know, and I do agree with Graham about John Howard. I think he was a prime minister who showed remarkable grace when he uh, was defeated at the election in 2006 and then withdrew from politics. I think you've got a lot of kudos for that. And it's interesting that when you go, to the, foot, you go to the football and you see uh, Bob Hawke, you see exactly the same sort of reaction by the public. I think there is an, a, a yearning in the public for that sort of, uh, you know, authenticity that both those men brought to politics. I guess usually Bob Hawke's... Uh draining a bit of the amber ale pretty quickly as well, which usually gets a good reaction, yeah. for better or for worse. Let's move into some policy areas, because I've been really intrigued. Maybe, I'm, uh, maybe I've been in the job too long, but by this fiscal rule, the Coalition might or might not be obeying. This is, if you ever have new spending, offset it with saving. This is the core Coalition element of fixing the budget, <coughs> Graham Morris. Now, Josh Frydenberg sort of equivocated on this last week. Matthias Cormann said, no, I don't know where this speculation is coming from. Scott Morrison said yesterday, there are exceptions to the rule and the government has a right to have discretion on it. Where are we on this? Is this a, a debate? Is this confusing rhetoric? Does it matter? Well, of course. Um, it, well, we're talking about billions in the budget, whether we're paying off this as debt or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, a government will always do what is in its self-interest and... Uh, it would hope in the national interest. <clears throat> there are times there, there are times there, you know, Bruce lived through it. Let's say you have a GFC and the whole world economy is collapsing. Are we really going to sit there and say, hey, we've got to cut everything and blah, 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 before we spend it? No, of course not. You know, you have to take in the prevailing mood at the time. And, and look, there is no doubt Matthias and the Prime Minister and the Treasurer will be saying to other ministers, we need to prune, not just spend. Mm. But you can do both. Sure, and I think between now and polling day, they will do the both. The issue right here, though, and well, that'll be the question, whether this in my, is in my EFO. I take your point about GFC, and there's always, you know, an exception to the rule. But right now, we've got the economy actually chugging along well, more money coming in. But this situation of needing to find a political fix on the GST in education seemingly has imperiled this rule. Yeah, well, look, that's right, Tom, but... You think, you know, the, the Tony Abbott first budget, you know, we're still banging our heads against the brick wall on some of those cuts that we're never going to get through the Senate. So you have to put your common sense hat on, on a bit too, mm. that yes, there are times when things should be pruned, but if you, if you say we're going to cut something and it doesn't get through the Senate, then you get absolutely murdered for the cuts. You get no benefit for the economy and it's terrible. We'll see what maybe cuts that are palatable they can try to come up with. Bruce Hawke, we've had Labor come in and say they'll be sticking to this rule. Now, we'll probably see some voter scepticism given what happened last time around. But what I want to ask you is, what about changing policy when conditions change? Labor's negative gearing on housing and capital gains tax changes. Do they have to look at that? Good question. Well, I, I'm not convinced that they do. I, I think we just have to wait and see what happens with the housing market. I mean, in places like uh, New South Wales, or particularly Sydney and Melbourne, it's under a bit of pressure. But uh, in other... Mm. And, 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 and some would argue that it's getting back to levels which are more sensible because, uh, you know, yeah. there was real bubbles in, in, uh, in the housing market and, and, to some extent, continue to be in those states where it's really denying people an opportunity ever to be able to buy into the Sydney market or the Melbourne market. But in places like Brisbane and, and, uh, and, and uh, Hobart, Adelaide, you know, you're seeing uh, the, the property markets popping up a little bit. So... Um, I don't think it's a clear-cut case of saying, oh, well, you've got to start looking at changes to negative gearing uh, because uh, of, yeah. of this. Look, uh, that's just my view. I think, I think you make a, a good point, Bruce oh. Hawker. Sorry to jump in. Oh, oh, you know, this is clearly has been a stratospheric rises and they've been going down gently for a little while, so there's maybe been too much hand-wringing. I'm not seeking to sort of join the woe is our housing market, but what about the political reality? If we have another five or six months ahead of the election, and we've been steadily going down for a little while now, 
is that Labor policy, and I know it's grandfathered and they talk about the careful approach, but mm. it has to have some effect because it raises tens of billions of dollars. Is that Labor policy becoming a bit of a risk to the party? Well, I think it'd be foolish for any party to say that everything is always locked in uh, concrete. And, and Graham's point about the GFC is a good one. You know, every now and then things come along which, uh, which mean that you actually have to change uh, accepted political orthodoxy and economic orthodoxy and inject money into the economy and change policies which may have seemed like a really good idea before. But I think it's far too early to say that in the case of, uh, of negative gearing. Let's wait and see what happens. And then I think they will make an informed decision. If they think in the party leadership that this is going to be uh, harmful, not only to their prospects, but to people who want to buy homes, then uh, they will have a rethink about it. But I, I don't think we're anywhere near that at the moment. No, but I think, I think Tom's question is an absolute beauty. You know, Bill Hayden should have been Prime Minister of this country, except he made a mistake and the Liberal Party, and I was part of the campaign, went berserk with a campaign called Wealth Tax on the family home. I, I, I would be running half of Scott Morrison's campaign on, you know that house you've got and you thought it was worth X? Well, under Bill Shorten, it won't be. It'll work, be worth X minus Y. Well, that would and be I a lie. Think, I think but that, that is... That, but that would no, be a it's lie. Not. Because, it, but because they, put, the family home is exempted from these... From these uh, from Labor's policies, the capital gains, it's a lie. capital gains tax, and negative gearing will drop the, the value of, of homes, and that is everybody's home. And I think this could be really, really quite a vulnerability for Bill Shorten if the Prime Minister can explain it to mums and dads. Well, if some of the heat goes out of the housing market in Sydney and Melbourne and continues to go down that path, I can show, and tell you one thing: that'll be a vote winner, not a vote loser, because mm. right now people can't afford to buy into those markets. It's terrible. And we're talking about people who are in good jobs, who should be living closer to the centre of the city, like, uh, like teachers, like nurses, like fireys, like policemen, like ambulance uh, personnel. These are the sort of people who are having to live you know, so far from the city centre in the areas where they work that it's completely unfair. That's, That's the sort look, of thing I mean, that you This is need. the interesting part about it, Bruce Hawker, that right mm. now, you're right, affordability is still a heck of a bigger issue, I would argue, than the housing market on the slide, but timing can be everything. And I suppose to your point, Graham Morris, can he get that message out to mums and dads? The news conference, the sort of Sunday, remember, it was a big Sunday news conference just before the last election where they had parents with a one-year-old and they were... Um, the, the message was, you know, our one-year-old, could we get another investment property for it? I don't know if that was the best way to cut through when you're talking about <laughs> yeah, uh, investment no, properties. No, uh, no, no, I agree. <clears throat> I agree. But there is a way of doing it. And Sydney particularly, and Melbourne and Brisbane, the, the psyche of the cities work on people's, the value of people's homes. And if that is being threatened, that is political dynamite. Well, I think we can get an insight as to what will be certainly attempted again. And uh, it wasn't really a big part of the last campaign, but could be this time around. Let's talk tax finally. It seems inevitable, Graham Morris, that we'll see the government switch to... Basically, this money no longer going to big business. The rest of the tax cut they were planning, it's going to go to businesses prob probably up to a turnover of $50 million because of political reality. Yeah, too right. And they wake up fairly late. And the biz big end of town did almost bugger all until it was too late to explain why it was important for the Australian economy compared with the rest of the world. You know... It, God helps those who help themselves, and so do, so do prime ministers and treasurers. And I don't think the big end of town helped themselves much at, at, is, at all is until this the end. For the coalition, just to jump in, that the, the big part of the job creation was always the bigger business. That's what we were told, and we had these, these um, you know, formulas on improving the budget, and I should say improving the economy, not the budget. But they go out the window now, don't they? Well, you know, everything now is going to fo focus on small to medium and the government is going to have a whole heap of money that it can do something politically attractive with. Could Does that happen? make it harder for Labor, Bruce Hawker? Well, uh, if the government's got money to spend, then uh, therefore the Labor has money to spend as well because they go off the same uh, predictions as to the economic 
conditions that the government goes off, and they, therefore they've got exactly the same amount of money to, to play around with. I think Labor won't go beyond what they're saying now as far as tax cuts for small businesses are concerned. They may, but already it's down to 27%, I think, or 27.5%. 27 27.5%. 27 yeah, you yeah, don't think they'll have to weigh that up for at least maybe part of it, the smaller side of those businesses, if the government goes without okay. Bruce Hawker and they're going to have to go to an election saying they'll increase it? Well, I don't... I, I don't think so, but, again, you have to wait and see. I, I think they will say, well, we're going to spend money in other areas. And that's what governments and oppositions do. They make their priorities as to what, uh, you know, they sh they're going to spend their money on. You know, lay this frees up money that was going to be spent on big business and tax cuts for other areas for Labor. Health, education, you know, strong policy areas, maybe housing. Uh, that they can now inject significant amounts of money into. They have to make a considered position uh, and decision as to where they're going to get the best bang for their buck and where their voters are going to get the best bang for their buck from the money that's freed up. It won't necessarily be with tax cuts for small business beyond what they've already gone to. Remember that they've already gone... Uh, they've already backtracked on some changes that they were going to make yeah. on, on tax for small business. They've already abandoned that, and I don't think they're going to go any further. That would be my sense. Yeah, yeah, they'll have tax increases. Beauty. That very, um, well, ill-fated short announcement by Bill Shorten that didn't last for too long. Is it, mm. To what you're referring there, Bruce Hawker, look, we'll see how that plays out. Bruce Hawker and Graham Morris, thanks for your time. See you, Tom. Pleasure. When we come back, we'll have the last word. Paul Murray and Janine Perrett joining me. Stay with us.